Welcome to My Life, Chassidus Applied, episode 354. This program is dedicated anonymously in honor of Rabbi Simon Jacobson. Being that next Sunday night will be Shavuos, a holiday, so consider this as a program that will cover both uh, this week as well as Chassidus Applied to Shavuos. Well, from the sheer volume of uh, messages and questions and comments coming in about the Miron tragedy, that alone reflects what's on our hearts and our minds. So I will address that and begin with that because this is so close to us all. Our hearts, our souls, our prayers go out to all the families who have... uh, suffered a loss of their loved ones, and especially when you see the Kiddush Hashem, the sanctification of God's name, that they are, in, in ways that are just unimaginable, that they are expressing in their words of faith, of betachen, belief in God and His goodness. It's something to uh, behold. We all wish we didn't have to behold it, and all this would never have happened, but it did. So we as Jews have always done, rise to the occasion. We cry and we build. We mourn and grieve over the loss. We don't have answers to the big why, to the big question of why, but we do have an answer to what are we going to do about it. That we forge ahead and we will do everything possible to honor them in a healthy way, in a productive way, and to fill as much as we can possibly fill the vacuum that they left, these 45 neshamas. And we hope that they now, near God, will pray for us and help us finish the last remnants of the work we need to do in Golis in order to be able to finally march into the Gu'ula, Hamitiz Vashlem, even before Matan Teira Shavuos this year. So, I'm going to begin with addressing more questions and comments that had come in about this topic. I don't even like to call it a topic. And um, as well as cover, this is the week of Pasha Bamidbar, going right after that into Shavuos, Sunday night, next Sunday night. So, let us address that. The first question maybe the most prominent one of all. The question is, where is Mashiach? After all these tragedies, the latest being the Miron tragedy, part of the big question, since the Rebbe said 30 years ago, do all you can to bring Mashiach, and still we are trying, learning, and doing the deeds, learning some of the sikhs. If I'm not mistaken, the Rebbe says... Everything is completed. All we need to do is usher him in. So where is he? Since that sikha, how many tragedies have there been? Gimel Thomas, wars, intifadas, terror attacks, natural tragedies, civil ones. This latest Miran tragedy. If everything is complete, why are all these things still happening? How many neshamas does God need up there? How many mitzvah campaigns? Avish Yisrael has been done since then, till now, but it's still not achieved the goal. Year after year, the same results. Have we gotten it all wrong? Has Hashem, has Hashem forgotten about us? How many more tragedies has to happen, or how many mitzvahs do we need to do until Mashiach comes? Haven't we suffered enough? Haven't we learned enough? I mean, these words echo the sentiments of many people. I myself have received at least 20, if not more, comments of the same nature. This captures it. What can I say? I can say as we all cried together, we all all puzzled together, and I repeat the Rebbe's own words. Once the Rebbe began to speak in that fashion, that we have done everything, and what we have to do is open our eyes, 
greet Mashiach, finish that last step. So the Rebbe said, since everything has been done, so why has Mashiach not come? So there was a time the Rebbe's answer to that would have been, because there's something still to do. In the later years, the Nuns, basically 1990, 1991, 1992, the Rebbe's response was, we have a question. In other words, the Rebbe did not say, let's do this, but this. Obviously, you have to keep doing, because we that's that's clearly what we're commanded to do. And we need to prepare the world as much as possible, even if it's ready. There's clearly more to do. But that was not his answer. His answer was his taka question. So how do you reconcile the two? The answer is, I mean, say if everything has been done, means Avedis and Berurim have been finished. But there's still something we have to do, whether it's being aware of it, whether it's continuing to reach more people. So it's not quite dependent on that, but still means we need to do it. And that's for sure, no matter what. We have our Avedis, we have our Shlichus. But clearly, as the Rebbe said, do everything you can means there's something from us that needs to be done. Now, to explain all these tragedies, are they wake-up calls? Are they telling us we're not doing right? None of us have the power or the authority or the right to say something like that. The Rebbe didn't even say that. The tragic killing of Mrs. Lapine back in 1992, when the Rebbe spoke, he didn't say that. But the Rebbe was a, a, was a complete, overwhelming question, not an answer. Not saying, okay, that's a sign. So that's why I hesitate to go in that direction. But at the same time, the Rebbe taught us that anything that happens, we need to increase and do everything possible. In the words of the Rambam, a catastrophe strikes a community. We have to be introspective, soul search, and become better people. So there's no question from the Rebbe's point of view, the time has already come a long time ago, and the Ebershah should have sent Mashiach. Why did not? We don't have an answer. But as long as we're here, and as long as there's still a tragedy, and there's still a loss, and there's still a world that has not been redeemed in the fullest sense of the word, we have a job to do. And that's what we need to focus on. I've said this many times. It's maybe difficult to hear. For me, it's also difficult to hear. But focusing on why didn't it happen, and focusing on the questions ends up just leaving us paralyzed. That is why, though we have the questions and we acknowledge them and we, together we cry about them, but the end question has to be, what are you and I going to do? There's really no other option. Because the other approach is just sitting and asking questions. And that usually will weaken us and demoralize us because there's no full answer. Even if someone's going to come up with something, it's not going to be a complete answer. So we were trained, and I say trained by whom? The Rebbe, and by Torah giants throughout history, the Rabbein before the Rebbe, that the main question is, what are you and I going to do? So we cannot use this even as a subtle excuse. The Rebbe said everything is ready, so we can just sit and lie and wait, lie down and wait. No, that's not an option, period. The question remains a question, and at the same time, if you want to call it a paradox, so be it. That's how we were trained that even in times where we don't have answers, we forge ahead. That's in general the healthy approach to life. And especially considering that we don't know the mysteries of God's ways. So I read this letter because it does reflect exactly what many of us feel. But at the same time, I don't have an answer. Yes, we have to learn from this. That means there's something we still need to do. And we continue doing. But at the same time we say, Look, it's thousands of years that Jews, almost 2,000 years in Golis. Ad Mosai. And the same time that we say that, we continue to do. That was what the Rebbe did. He would cry Ad Mosai, and then he would push us and motivate and inspire to forge ahead, to continue bringing the message of Teda and Mitzvahs of Tzedek and Yeshua to the world, and the message of Mashiach. So think of it this way. Mashiach comes right the second everyone will be ecstatic. But if it comes a second later, 
This second that we have right now, we have to use to the fullest to bring it to more people. There are 8 billion people on this planet that are not aware, or most of them are not aware of chassidus, of teda, of what God wants of them. We're not depending on that because we've done enough to have reached a tipping point. And Mashiach and God will do the rest. But as long as we're still here, we have to do whatever we can to reach more people. And that's why I do a program like this and that's why you and your obligations and whatever your sphere of influence is has to continue doing what you have to do. That is how we have been trained and this is what we need to do. And this is also, frankly, the healthiest way to deal with these issues. Anything else will be too overwhelming, too debilitating, too demoralizing. Another question. Dear Rabbi Jacobson, can you explain what the concept of betochen means in the midst of such a tragedy like Miran? How can we trust Hashem if sometimes tragedy hits? Thank you. It goes back to the same paradox. The issue of betochen, which is trust, and a moon of faith, is tested in this greatest way when things like this happen. But that's precisely what Amun and Betachan are. They are things we turn to when we don't have answers. So to say, I will only have Amunah when things are working my way, you don't need Amunah for that. When things are working, you could just say, logically, I thank God. Amunah and Betachan, as I once heard from someone, or one of, a, one of the uh, victim of a terrorist attack, who survived, thank God. But with the many, many... Uh, uh, let's, shall we say, injuries. And she told me these words. She said, that morning I woke up and I felt I was giving up. I have no reason to live. So much was taken from me. At the same time, I had a surge of strength and I realized that you don't know how powerful Amunah and Betochen are until you have nothing left but them. You hear this? This is not coming from some... Uh, writer or thinker, person who experienced terrible loss. You don't know how powerful, you don't know how powerful Amun and Betochen are until everything else has been taken but that. When you have nothing but Amun and Betochen. So you suddenly realize it's enormous strength. And that is exactly what has given the Jewish people strength all the way back from when we left Mitzrayim, Egypt, that's what has given us strength. B'schus noshem sitkonius nigel avesenim mitzrayim. Their amuna, their faith. When things seemed all lost, when things seemed they were at the bottom of the abyss, hopeless, it was the amuna that kept them through. And they saw it through. And look, here we are. So you cannot des- deny the results. So if you want to go with a scientific, rational mind, no, Amun and Betochen do not necessarily seem like a mathematical equation. It doesn't seem like it's a rational thing. But we call it super rational. Not irrational, super rational. It's a strength that comes, a superhuman strength that comes more and deeper than all the logic and rationale in the world. Look at these families sitting Shiva. Look at their Amun and Betochen. I mean, it's hard to imagine put yourself in their shoes. When that father lost two children, cries out, God, Hashem, in Hebrew, don't take my amuna from me. Please, I ask you, don't take this as such an assignment, such a test, don't take my faith from me. So it's a super rational power in our neshama, in the soul, that is always there, but in times when there's real crisis and trauma and tragedy, and it rises, it becomes something that can save lives. Because it gives you the will to go on. It gives you the power to find deeper resources, dig deeper, and build, including in memory of the loved ones that were taken from us. Dear Rabbi Jacobson, thank you for your kind and comforting words regarding the tragedy in Maron. What you said resonated with me, and I appreciated it that clarity you offer during this time that is filled with confusion. Following this tragedy, 
How can we grow in our love, unity, and acceptance of all Am Yisrael, nation of Israel? What does that look like on a practical level? Thank you. Well, the first thing is, I'm glad you're writing this because that's exactly what we need to be thinking. How can we grow? And the answer is, really in your hands and my hands. It's what we do right now. In thought, speech, and action, that we make an absolute determined, determined resolution that you will do everything possible to increase in your kind words, in your kind act, your kind thoughts about another Jew, about another human being. And not just words, but actions. We're coming to Matan Torah next Sunday night. This year is 3,333 years. 33 years. Three, 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 three. Four threes. So it's a unique year. Matan Torah is symbolized by love and unity. And Rosh Chedesh Sivan, which is also coming this week, and Rosh Chedesh Sivan, what does it say? The Jewish people arrived, it says in Pasha Yisrael, the Jews rested, crossed the Mount Sinai. Says Rashi from Medrash. Says Yisrael, So it says, So Rashi says, Like one person with one heart. Up till that point, the Medrash explains, there were disagreements and conflicts. But when they stood before Sinai, the power of Sinai itself united them. One person, one heart. Yes, in stark contrast to the 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva who passed away during these days of Omer, of Forlag Bomer, due to their not respecting one another. And this is a precondition to Matan Torah because it says in the Medrash as well that if there was one person missing, God would not have given the Torah to the Jewish people. One person among millions. Because, like a heart, if one part of the heart is faulty, God forbid, the whole heart is affected. And that's what happened by, by, by Rosh Chodesh Sivan, and that's how we march into Matan Torah. So now an event like this happens, and you do see the Jewish people coming together of all walks of life, literally. I don't want to give people labels, but what you call them, Sfardim or Ashkenazim, Chassidim or the Litvish, Chilonim or Datim or Charedim, the religious or the secular, these are labels that I don't subscribe to, but just to give a, a just to describe, I have to try to describe this, come together and cry and grieve together with the families. That's absolutely a show of unbelievable love and unity. But it shouldn't stop there. When the grief is over, when the shiva ends, well, the grief will never end for some people until Mashiach comes. We have to continue in even greater ways a surge of love and unity. Yes, there are, I'm sure, global solutions for that and collective ones and communal, but it starts with an individual. What you talk about at your kitchen table, at your dinner, at lunch, at breakfast, with your children, with your husband, with your wife, with your families, with friends, let this be serve as a wake-up call and to make an effort to avoid gossiping, to avoid talking negatively about others. On the contrary, to do whatever we can to increase an avas chinam, unconditional love. That's what we do. And what will it look like? You tell me. What would your home, your community look like if everybody had taken upon themselves, takes upon themselves this type of an approach? It begins from the home. Make sure in your home, never speak negatively about another person, period. If you have something to say to your spouse, say it privately, and even then, avoid that as well. But definitely not with your children. Don't create such an environment. On the contrary, positive conversations, loving conversations, praising, limutzchus, finding merits in people. Does it take effort? Yes, it takes effort. But it's not as much effort as the exertion of those that are crying now for these losses. So that's the, that's the minimum that we can do. And that has, and you can always grow, grow in that area, motivating others, communicating via technology, making sure you're always sending positive messages, 
even initiate. Initiate like a chain letter used to be called. We can do that today with texting or other forms of technology. Kind words. Pass it on. Pass on this kind word to 10 people. Take your contact list and say, I'm going to send every day. If you can't do it every day, once a week. Beautiful thought. An uplifting thought, a heartwarming feeling. These small things make tremendous difference. The Rambam says one action, one thought, one speech, good word, t- can tip the scale and bring Shuv Atzala, Yeshuv Atzala, which is salvation, redemption, personal and global redemption to each of us and to the entire world. And what will it look like if we all do this? You'll have a world of Mashiach. A world of pure love and unconditional love, while also respecting the integrity of each individual. The next question. Understanding the why in tragedy. To the inimitable Ima Shpia and YouTube spiritual content creator, Rabbi Jacobson, thank you so much for your ongoing Chassidah Supply teachings. May Hashem, may Hashem bless you and yours with all his abundance, materially and spiritually. When religious Jews confront tragedy, especially when good people and children suffer, the immediate reaction is to ask why. We're, we're taught that there is a true judge who is fair and good and therefore are confounded when apparent cosmic injustice happens. We just saw this in the Torah with the deaths of Nadav and Avihu. Moshe immediately contextualizes their deaths. This is what Hashem said, that I will be sanctified by those close to me. Adam, however, chooses to remain silent. He doesn't seem to want to answer for God or explain their deaths. Instead, he seems to connect to the silence of realization that God's ways are unfathomable and therefore there's nothing to say. What lessons do you think we can learn from the way these two leaders dealt with Nadav and Avihu's death as it relates to the Miran tragedy? Okay, interesting question. First of all, let's remember Aaron is the father of the two children. Moshe is their uncle. And yet, Moshe is Moshe. But still, that may explain how they're speaking a bit differently. Aaron, of course, in a very biological way, is completely his children. Even though later we do learn, we do learn that Moshe, the Aaron's children are compared to children of Moshe because they, he taught them. Call him Alamed as Ben Chaver Yitera, the beginning of Parsha Bamidbar. We refer to the other children, Elozav in the summer of uh, Aaron, to children of Moshe as well. But still, that's just one, one point. Secondly, Moshe didn't come to explain. It's not an explanation. Why is still there? Remember, Moshe also heard from Hashem when he saw the Asari Eruga Malchus, the ten martyrs being brutally killed, and he said, is this Tere and its reward, and this is its reward, and Hashem said to him, Shtoik, kachola b'machshava, silent, be quiet. So Moshe understood well what quiet and silence is. Moshe was the one that was completely disturbed when he saw Tumas Mes, until Hashem showed him, Zeis Chukas Atera, as the Medrash says. When he saw the impurity of death, he was disturbed. So I wouldn't say that Moshe was coming to rationalize. It's important to mention, he's saying, that the fact of the matter is that I'll be sanctified. That was only saying that God, in a way, had already so-called had foreseen what would happen. Actually, they thought that it would be Moshe and Aaron. Moshe thought it would be Moshe and Aaron. And what means Akadish? Does it mean a person has to die? They'll be sanctified. There's many ways to sanctify God's name. So I don't see Moshe's words as being a justification or explanation. Why the why will always remember a big why, remain a big why, because there are many ways that this could have happened. Now, this could be further analyzed. Moshe's approach, Aaron's approach, is it really two different approaches? Was Moshe not silent in a certain way? Did Aaron not appreciate that his children were sanctified God's name? So I don't know if I would turn it into two philosophical approaches, but it's an interesting discussion. And I think also when you're, as I mentioned last week, when you're in the throes of the pain and the grief, you generally try to stay away from explaining things. Then you just have to let the pain get through you, heal from it, be strong with others, strengthen Amuna. People don't need explanations. 
I mean, to say, for example, that 45 souls are all Kadeshim and holy souls that God took, if a parent wants to say that, someone close, fine. But I would not go ahead and start using that and saying, these were the holiest souls, that's why they were taken. Not because it's not true, but it's not the time right now to try to explain God's ways. On the other hand, for us to strengthen each other in every possible way. And there comes the time where you can start talking, perhaps, in ways like that. And also then, what do we really know? I think that humility of silence remains always a dominant because of uh, the, the, the unfathomable part of this. Because God, could, at the end of the day, could have done everything differently. With all the sanctity and all the greatness, it could have been done differently. So we are humble in the face of this uh, tragedy. And um, we accept what God did, ultimately, even though um, we take accountability for what we do. And that's the approach I would take to this. Next question, or actually statement. I want to apologize for a question I sent in that you read during your Sunday evening program last week. In the aftermath of the, Miron, of the terrible tragedy in Miran, I was upset about what happened and used harsh language, which implied that the people that were hurt and killed were to blame because they were pushing and shoving. I regret writing a general statement that some people act like animals at large events. I hereby recant my statement. Obviously, what happened in Rome was a terrible accident due to overcrowding and poor crowd control by the authorities. And nobody deserved to be injured or killed. Even though I didn't personally know any of the 45 victims, because all our fellow Jews are part of one big family, I felt personally hurt by the tragedy. And my words were not based on logic and truth, but rather my emotions, which I let get the better of me. So therefore, I apologize to you and your viewers. The only part of my statement that I don't recant is where I said I hope these tragedies never happen again. Well, just as I read your initial note and my response to that, I read this, and i very um, commendable and honest of you to be open, and I'm glad that you shared this, and I share it with everyone. Above all, let's all use this to, for more love, more unity, not to point fingers, to grow in the process. Regarding the, another person writes in the same context, well, I have a lot here. So many letters came in, I must tell you, but I'm not going to read them all. Impossible to cover them all in one program. Regarding the distasteful questions regarding the crowd and Miran pushing, I listened to your replies and they are Nakuda Lamatara. That means to the point. Thank you. However, I just want to add that if anyone researches crowd control, they will see that most of the issues with crowds are not caused by pushing, but an anomaly, an, an anomaly in the crowd, i.e. a person, chaz v'shalom, God forbid, tripping, or a child losing a yarmulke, etc. The ripple effect from lack of sufficient room between people is what causes, Rahman al-Islam, the domino effect. Miran has not had something like this ever, regardless of the huge crowds each year. The anomaly here is still being debated, but it had nothing to do with people pushing each other, and, and, and it's an ignorant comment to make in of, in of itself. Thank you, Rabbi Jacobson, for your beautiful shiurim, Kol Tuv, and Surah Stavis. Hi, Rabbi Jacobson. Yet another comment on this topic. In regards to a question this week, the day after Lag Bremer, I was reading the Ein Yankiv in Chayenu, and there was a Gemara about some, someone getting crushed in the Beis HaMikdash. Yes. I, last week I'd read someone mention a Gemara. I didn't have a chance to look it up, but ever since I did, and thank you for pointing it out as well. In Psochim Samach Dalet Beis, Psochim 64b, it talks there about the people gathering the Beis Amigdash during Pesach, Aliyah Leregel. So there was, it says that no one ever gets crushed except one time that an older person got crushed. And they actually called it Pesach Meuchin, the crushed Pesach. You know, one person got crushed, which is a great tragedy, but they called the whole Pesach the crushed Pesach, which means it's not just one person, the whole Pesach was called crushed due to that loss. So firstly, the lesson in that is that we're all one, and the Pesach itself would be forever called, that, crush, that Pesach would be called the crushed Pesach, because even though there were probably beautiful, many beautiful things that had happened, not probably, for sure, and yet we remember that, the Gemara says. Interestingly, the Gemara continues that talks about how many people would come, so they say that the, the, the emperor then wanted to know how many people come together in Beis Amigdash, so they counted, and they found a tremendous amount of number of people, 
And as a result, they called the Pesach Me'ubin, from the word Av, thick. The thick or the very crowded Pesach. Just as an aside. Okay. Now, another question asked is following. I've heard other people addressing this tragedy, some very, impo- very empowering, inspirational, and others very critical, very distasteful. Can you comment on the other speakers addressing this tragedy? A few people sent me some links as well. Frankly, I don't want to comment on other speakers. They're responsible for their words. I'm not. Not that, not that God forbid that <laughs> we're not responsible for each other. And I don't think it's also appropriate at this time whether I find something that I would say differently. Number one, ain day is saying Shavas. People think differently and respond differently. As long as it's api teda and api chsidis. I mean, I come from the world of teda and chsidis, so to me, that's the criteria. There are people sometimes say things that uh, they're finger pointing, people blame. Um, and, uh, and obviously, that's not an approach I subscribe to. I don't think it's a Taylor approach. But I don't want to get into now a debate about this topic and definitely not critical. It's not a time for that. It's a time for the Achdus. And suffice, suffice it to say, about any subject matter, you're going to find people say different things. Some of them may be on target, some may not be. Some may be al Taylor, some may not be. And I don't think now is the time for me to get into determining what exactly is, what exactly isn't. If something's distasteful, so don't listen. Not for you. Or try to find clarity by the person, or you always Islam at schus, you never know what a person's intention. Maybe it came across harsh or, or something that wasn't understood completely. That's what I would like to say about that. In that context, another person writes, I find it offensive that whenever a terrible tragedy occurs, people start blaming others. Specifically, the first thing that many big rabbis do is blame women by saying the tragedy occurred because women's wig length is too long or because their clothing is immodest. Why don't the rabbis put the onus on men to take responsibility for their actions? And in the case of the tragedy in Maron, why can't the rabbis just look at the simple physics as the cause? There were too many people in a small area that caused the accident, not mixed dancing. Okay, well, this is the same context of what I just said. I don't want to point fingers. No, I don't believe that the first thing you do is, is blame all the women for tzniyas issues. Yes, we should all be introspective, as the Rambam says, but that is a lesson to teach to ourselves. To get up and start saying, you're to blame, you're to blame, that one's to blame. That's not a tater. If you get up and say, I, as a leader, feel responsible, and I'm going to take upon myself to be a better Av Yisrael, more love, and more unity, and more inspiring, and less condescending, and less judgmental, that's a very respectful thing. You're speaking about yourself. But to start blaming anyone, individually or groups, is completely inappropriate from my point of view. It's also, I mean, maybe it motivates some people out of fear, but it's not really long-term motivational. And even if you want to bring up a flaw or a fault in the community, among all of us, men or women, there's ways to say it that are motivating, that are inspiring, instead of just criticizing, which is part of a big problem. We have judgmentalism and critique that is just sometimes you feel like the person thinks they're holier than thou. And, they, and you know, we don't even know what's going on beneath the surface of any person's life. And that definitely does not help the situation. Okay. Hi, Rabbi Jacobson. I'm going to do two more on this topic. I want to talk with you today about the tragedy of Rahman al-Islam that occurred this past like by Imran Miran. I was debating whether I should write the following lines since I don't like to focus on negativity. However, because of the magnitude of the tragedy, I feel compelled to write my feelings. As you said last week, on the one hand, we don't understand Hashem's ways, but on the other hand, the Rambam writes that when tragedy strikes, God forbid, may no Jew know from it, we have to be introspective and correct our ways if you don't mind to share, where's the Rambam is this? I said, the beginning of the laws of Tainias, the laws of fasting, right in the beginning. He starts with that. The Rambam in Hilchis in Mishnah Ter. I'm reminded of the expulsion of the Jews of Gush Katif, Gaza, some 16 years ago. I believe in 2005, Tisha B'Av time. So why am I mentioning this now? Why am I mentioning this now? The truth is, 
I wanted to talk about this for a long time, but the situation compelled me to talk about it now. As far as I remember, most of the Orthodox Jewish community was silent about the Gzera to expel the Jewish people from Gush Katif. Even in the Chabad community, only a few rabbis protested the Gzera. The mainstream Chabad leadership was unfortunately silent. What was done in Gaza was pure. Well, the guy uses the word Nazism. I don't like to use that word, but he does. It should be never have happened in the, in the Jewish state. If the Rebbe was physically here at that time, he would, definitely not been, he would definitely not have been silent as far as I know the Rebbe. So what's the point of talking about this now since it's something from the past? Firstly, if we did something wrong in the past, we have to acknowledge it, regret it, and to make a firm resolution to correct it in the future. Should such a situation come up, Hashem should help. There shouldn't be any such situa- more such situations. For example, we shouldn't be silent about the situation of the Jews in France. I hope you'll discuss this. I know it's not pleasant, but we can all talk we can't talk only about the beautiful things. May we merit only good tidings from all the Jewish people. May we mer- merit the revelation of Mashiach now. I did hesitate whether I should read this, but you know, I think it's a time to let people just express their raw feelings. I do believe it's not appropriate to bring up right now. Um, there are many things that we may have done better. There are times for everything. So for that reason... I read it, but I wanted to make that statement because I know other people have all kinds of things that they have, grievances, and maybe things that are correct that in the sense that should, things should have been done. I don't want to go now into a debate about Gaza and Gush Katif, why people did comment, did comment, what the Rebbe would have done. We know the Rebbe's position in general, but there's also a time for everything. Right now there's an open graves, and I mean that, and, and wounded hearts and bleeding hearts. That's what we need to be focusing on, not because we are avoiding unpleasant. This is also is unpleasant. But it's focusing right now. It's not appropriate when people are grieving and crying over losses that happened in Miran, Alag Beimer, to start talking about other challenges. So I wanted to just state that for the record. The topic itself to be introspective, absolutely. You want to correct something within yourself by all means. Okay, finally, I'll do one more. There is a text going around on social media that quotes an obscure Zayar called, okay, it's called Idra Rabba saying that 45 people will be crushed by a falling wall. Is there any truth to this? First of all, the word obscure is not an obscure czar. Those that know czar is not obscure. For those that don't know czar, or other books, they're, they're, they're all obscure. So yes, there is a czar going around that I saw. It's an Idra Rabba. Idra Rabba is Zayar Pasha Nosei. Idra Rabba is the large group, the 10 students, together with the Rajbi. Three of them pass away. And there's the Idra Zuta, which is what happens on Lag Ba'emir, later in Zayar's Hazinu, just for the technicality. So it was going around a text, which really has nothing to do with this at all. It's just there, if you look there in the Zayar, it's about Elio Novi saying that he came to, went to save Rabbi Menuna Saba, and in the process, 45 people from the, from the emperor, the Romans, were killed. Nothing to do with like Bahamir, nothing to do with Miran, nothing to do with Rajbi. So yes, the number 45 is used, but it's not uh, in any way relevant. So... Um, that's in 144b, the second volume of Zer, if you want to look it up. I will mention that another thing is going around from the Ben Ishchai. He has a sefer called Yehoyoda. So on Rosh Hashanah 31b, where it talks about Rabbi Yechon and talks about the Geula, so he says that the Geula will come in the merit of 45 tzaddikim. 45 is the same gematria as Geula. Geula is 45. So if you want to read into that as far as this being a step to the Gula. Again, this is not justifying in no way consoling us over their loss and death. But hints are always there. Hints of 45. If you want to look at that, you can look at it. But I'm always careful not to try to read too much into it because it's, it, it's not wise to do. It starts becoming, okay, so that's what God, God did, took 45 people to... No, because you could have had other ways that 45 tzaddikim could bring the Gula, obviously. But I'm mentioning it just as, a, as, a, as part of the discussion. I will also mention, finally, in this context, I did several programs on this topic. Right, Lagba Emer in the beginning, Oy Rajbi, how can we celebrate on Lagba Emer? As well as a, by, the, by request by many of you to have a, a, we had a Zoom, hundreds and hundreds of people joined from all walks of life to ask questions and share. Very powerful evening. All this you can find on, uh, on our site in, in, at the... Um, MeaningfulLife.com, and also on YouTube if you want to hear or listen to more on this topic. And I also did something last Sunday as well, 
about speaking around areas of, of, uh, of tragedy. Can we really speak about it? The, the, the evening, the Zoom evening, was called Coping with the Iran Tragedy. A question, answer, open question, answer discussion that we had. Okay. Somewhat related, but not really, is the students of Rabbi Akiva seems to be also a topic that on minds of many of you. So I'll, I'll read a few questions from there. And um, here we are. Dear Rabbi Jacobson, why should lack of respect be a cause for death? Thank you for your constant voice of clarity and perspective, especially when we so desperately need it. This week you touched upon the students of Rabbi Akiva and how some connected it to the tragedy in Miran. Why at all did Talmud Rabbi Akiva, did the students of Rabbi Akiva deserve to die? Why is the lack of Avis Yisrael, of respect, is the exact word in the Gemara, a reason to be killed? Do we find just punishment in the Torah? Especially the way the Rebbe explains their lack of mutual respect, that seemingly there wasn't any personal fights or, or hurting. Thank you. Okay, very good question. You're correct, there's no such punishment. But there's the concept, you remember, to add, to add a question, answer a question with a question. Why the students of Rabbi Akiva, of all people, of all students? Rabbi Akiva was the one that said, Loving your fellow is the fundamental principle of Teirah. His students must have heard that from Rabbi Akiva more than once. And of all people, they should be the ones that should not respect one another. So the way it's explained is it was not because of their pettiness or because of their vanity or because of their um, uh, harshness. It was because of their greatness. They were so, each one of them was so passionate about his approach to learning Torah, the Torah Rabbi Akiva, his teacher, that they lost sight. Nichve bechupashe shal chaveri, the Gemara says, that you can get burned by the canopy of your friend because of his passion. Sometimes a person is the throes of passion, they don't have the discipline, so another person can get hurt. Their lack of respect was not a deliberate way of hurting one another. It was they so strong with their opinions that the opinions clashed. And as a result, not as a punishment, as a result, when level people on that level clash, that alone creates a, a plague, an epidemic that took their lives. Chassidus brings an example of Shvidus HaKelim. These are the shattering of the containers in the world of Toyo. That the energies are so intense and the containers are too flimsy and fragile that the containers clash and it shatters. So shattering can come through a war, an avarice and real hatred of each other, and it can come sometimes from too much intensity without ba- b- b- discipline, restraint, and balance. And it was that intensity that caused this plague. So it wasn't a punishment for a particular not behaving. It was a collective result of people. They destroyed themselves, in a sense, by, through their own intensity. That's one way to explain it. Another way you can say is because they were students of Rabbi Akiva, and that high standard much more was expected from them than a regular person. And at the end of the day, what do we remember? The plague happened, but we remember, we grieve and mourn over it and don't make weddings and celebrations during Omer, but we learn from it the power and importance of Avis Yisrael. When we are together, we're blessed. Unfortunately, pirud halavavis, divisiveness, not only doesn't it bring blessings and peace, shalom, the end of the Mishnah, old Mishnahis. God did not find a keli. doesn't say he, Shalom is a keli for, for blessings. He could not find another keli for blessing except peace. Why? Because when there's peace, there's a container to hold on to the blessings. When a family is fighting, a father can't even bring the blessings because there's nowhere to, for him to be. There's quarrel. So in addition to what I said, their quarreling created the opposite of blessing. And people on that level, that's what we have, a shattering. So when a family fights, it's very hard for a father, Barcheno Avinu, our father in heaven, to bring a blessing. He wants to give the blessing, but where is it going to go when, there's, when, the, when the people below are not talking to each other or fighting with each other? So the lesson is a tremendous lesson, how much we have to add in Avish Yisrael. And no surprise, as we go from there, we go into Matan Teireh, Vayichan Sham Yisrael, Neged Ahar, Belev Echot, 
like one person with one heart. We know that the reason why Rabbi Kiva We know that the reason why Rabbi Akiva's students passed away was because they didn't have respect for each other, resulting for a deep, resulting for a deep appreciation for their teacher. Their personal love for Rabbi Akiva and his teachings blinded them from having respect for their companions. That's yet another part of the explanation, yes. I was thinking this sounds similar to the students of the Magad and the Alter Rebbe. The other student of the Magad came down very strongly on the Alter Rebbe for introducing Chabad Chassidus and felt that it didn't align with the teachings of the Magad. Do you, view, do you view these two scenarios as similar and perhaps both sourced in the same issue? Looking forward to your response. Thanks. Unequivocally, no. First of all, we have the story with Avram Kalisker and you have the others that did not agree with Alter Rebbe's approach. It doesn't say Lainogu covered Zeb Zed to the extent that there was a plague. Thank God everybody lived. Obviously, disagreements among students is always something to address, but no one says this disagreement was necessarily, even though the Alter Rebbe, we go by the Alter Rebbe, and the Alter Rebbe made it clear that this was the approach he received from the Magid and that Kaliska was wrong. But we don't have to go to the extent and say that this was like the students of Rabbi Akiva. Is the fact that different students can have different opinions? Well, yeah, Beishame Beishil, both had teachers, Shmaya Vavtalian, and this way, nevertheless, they heard two different approaches. Throughout history, you have it. So the idea of different approaches is not necessarily a problem. When there's a lack of honor and respect for each other, for whatever the reason, that's already going to another level. So I wouldn't compare it. There's a lot more to be said about that. I don't want to go now to the different approaches to the student, by the Magid students. It deserves its own discussion, which we'll do at a later point. Another question. We know the reason why Rabbi Kiva students passed away was because they didn't have respect for each other. Actually, they're just, sorry. <laughs> and repeat. Let's cut that. Fine. Okay. So we covered this to some extent. I want to move over since this week is Pasha Bamid, so Shredish Sivan, Pasha Bamidbar, and Shavu is next Sunday night. So let's talk a bit about that. Let's start with Bamidbar. We always read the Pasha Bamidbar before Shavu is. Question is why? So the Gemara says to be mafsi because Pasha Bachokaisi has the Techecha, the curses. You don't want to go straight from the curses into Mat and Teir. Bamidbar. Why Bamidbar? It's not just you stick something in. There must be a connection. So, of course, the, 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 the name itself, Bamidbar Sinai. That's where Har Sinai is. That's where they received the Teir. But still, it's called Bamidbar. Midbar is a wilderness. So, the Medrash explains that there are different reasons why God gave the Jews the Torah in a midbar. Because the obvious question is, you're going to give a chem de gnuza, a precious treasure to someone, you don't choose a, a arid and dangerous and, and hot and uncomfortable desert. You go to a beautiful city, go to Jerusalem and give them the Torah there. Lahavdu, you go to a beautiful restaurant. I don't know about these days, but you go to give someone a gift. So different reasons given. One reason is because the midbar is a mokem hefker. No one can claim possession over a mid because it's not a place, a person, it's not a place of civilization. So if you lose an object in a mid, but nobody can say, it's mine. You lose in a city, so you look at whose property it may be and all the different signs. The Abishta wanted to give the terror in a place that nobody can lay claim over it and claim royalties. So he gave it in a place, no man's land. If he would have given it in any other city, the people in that city would later say, every time you have a class, a Torah class, we want royalties. doesn't say that in the Medrash, but I'm just driving the point home. That's one reason. Another reason is given a Midbar, because you have to be like a Midbar. Empty yourself like a wilder, like an arid place to receive the Torah. The Alter Rebbe explains, Lo Yoshev Adam Sham means, in the negative, it's below civilization. On the positive, it's beyond civilization. The Torah was given a place that was not shaped by human structures and human civilization. So Midbar, by Midbar, coming right before Manteira, makes total sense. Be like a Midbar. Also, Midbar comes from the word Medaber. Vidabartabam. You shall speak the words of Teira. What is the personal lesson to us? Before Mat says, Moshe Kibal Teira mis Sinai. Moshe received the Teira from Sinai. He received the Teira from Hashem. Why does it say mis Sinai? Because Sinai was a mountain, but it was the slowest of all mountains. Mochech Mokal to teach us two things. 
that when you receive Teda, when you learn Teda, number one, you have to be like a mountain. You have to be proud like a mountain. Not like a plateau, definitely not like a valley. But among mountains, be the humblest. Humility. Moshe Kibbal Teda Messinai. He received Teda Messinai. He also received from Sinai the humility that's necessary to be a receptacle, to be Makabal, Moshe Kibbal. So the receiving of the Torah comes right after Mamidbar to teach us this lesson, to be a Midbar, Midbar Sinai, in receiving the Torah. Type of bitl, like it says, Venafshi ka'ofel ha'koyal tiyeh, psachli bi besayda secha. Nafshi, my spirit, ka'ofer, la'koyal tiyeh, is like, like dust before all, humble like dust, and that opens you up, psachli bi, open my heart to Torah. So it's the humility that creates an empty receptacle, container, keli, to receive Torah and all its blessings. The message of humility, which of course is also the key to Avis Yisrael. As the Alter Rebbe says in Tanya, when a person makes his body primary and his soul secondary, it means there's no bitl, it's about me, there can't be true love. Love is a result of bitl, of humility. Not allowing your ego and your egocentric consciousness to be dominant. In Pasha Nasipa Midra itself, we received a few questions. Do we have an image of the flags of the tribes? In Pasha Midra, it says each tribe had a, and, and had a Nasi and also a unique, colorful flag. Do we have any of these flags preserved somewhere today or perhaps even drawing so we know what they look like? The Medish talks about some of these flags with descriptions as what the symbolism they have. I've never seen anyone really replicate it. I'm sure there is something. If anybody has anything, please share it. I didn't really look, so I can't fully answer it. I think the Medrash does have a description of each of the flags, and it's usually like, for example, Don is compared in the Brachis of, Mo- of, uh, of Yaakov Avinu to Anochosh, a uh, serpent, and there's other um, comparisons to the different tribes, not ne- ne- negative ones, that became part of their flags according to some opinions. But I wanted to look more into it about the flags, what the Golem represented, and, um, and I'll get back to you more, more about that. But I wanted to read it. How do we reconcile that in some places the Torah asks Klal Yisrael to do a census, like in the beginning of this chapter, Minyan, and count everyone? In another place it implies that counting is not a good idea because it can bring an eye in horror. Right? It says don't count. So first of all, the difference is when God says so and we do so on our own. When God says so, obviously he protects and it all shows about Rashi says, why is there a census several times? Because when you love something, you count. The Ramban explains, because when you count, you have to look at it. And when you look at it, you love something, you want to look at your children. But that's a count that comes from above. Whether we should go count people, I'm not talking now, I'm not getting now into the government census, we're talking about people. Counting is something that you stay away from because it doesn't create a bracha. Rach is like doge hayam, like the fish in the sea. You can't count because they're under the water. So we don't count. That's why the Rebbe once told my grandfather actually that, uh, you know, about how many grandchildren you have. The Rebbe said, it's selfless kineniklach. You don't count grandchildren. Counting is, so it all comes down to if it's shamayim, God mandates accounting, and there were ten, nine countings, and the minyan asiri, the tenth will be when Mashiach comes. That's a divine. God is counting and counting toward blessing. That's the general answer to that question. Okay, now. <clears throat> there is follow-up since Mashiach is on our, in our thoughts and our feelings and our words, especially coming from the 30 years since the Rebbe said the famous Chof Ches Nisan Sicha, 28th of Nisan, Tov Shinun Aleph. So we're 30 years from then. So a lot of questions came Mashiach, but because of events, I didn't address them all, so I want to just cover a few more and continue to covering as we go along. When Mashiach comes, that was the title and a lot of questions about that. So I think this is appropriate to keep the Mashiach passion going. We should do everything possible to understand it, be able to communicate the importance of it to others so we all become active, proactive in spreading the word and getting us all to be aware of and live Mashiach. Will there be an official, when Sheikh comes, will there be an official announcement? Who will be responsible to make this announcement? So we look in the Rambam, which is Halacha. Medrashim, as the Rebbe points out many times, there are many different opinions. They're not necessarily definitive. 
halacha is halacha. The Rambam says, in the beginning of uh, Hilchus Melachim, chapter 11, he says that uh, the different signs, Mashiach will come from the house of David, he will be committed to Torah and Mitzvahs, will influence others, will fight a battle. That makes a Mashiach, uh, Cheskes Mashiach, presumed to be Mashiach. Then, when the third temple is built, he wins the battle, and the third temple is built, and gathers all the exiles, Kibbutz Nitzchei Yisrael, Kibbutz Yisrael, that is Mashiach Vade, definite. He doesn't say anything about an announcement. Later he does bring, which is always we always hear about, <laughs> that Eliyahu and Navi will come and make an announcement. But there are a lot of opinions what that means. Will that be a moment before Mashiach comes? Will it be a while before? So that what we know about an announcement will come from Eliyahu and Navi, who will be sent by God as his messenger to say Mashiach is coming. Now how does that reconcile with what the Ramam says, the Beis Amigdash, when you build the Beis Amigdash? So some say that there are different opinions, that maybe Eliyahu Novi doesn't have to come. The fact that Mashiach will come and build the Beis Amigdash, that alone is a sign. Others say, no, that itself. Hillel will come and say, here's Mashiach. Hashem sent me to tell you Mashiach is coming. He's going to rebuild the Beis Amigdash. So there's different scenarios possible. The most important point, we will know. <laughs> we will know when Mashiach actually arrives. The Rebbe says Mashiach is already here. The ghoul is already here, but we have to open our eyes. So that also requires a form of announcement. Maybe you have to announce it to yourself. Maybe you have to wake up, become more conscious. Remember, eyes is not just physical eyes being open. It has to also be your mind. It has to be your receptive, your awareness. So the most important thing is that it should happen. And however it happens, we will find out. We will know quite quickly. Okay. When Mashiach is fully revealed, will there still be a mitzvah? Will we, will be, will we still have a mitzvah to believe in Hashem? So first of all, all mitzvahs, teter zulei te mechlefes, mitzvahs are nitzchim. The teter will never change, the mitzvahs will never change. They're eternal. Regarding statements in the Gemara that mitzvahs will be bottled, betelis, will cease to be, or the different things that Teter talks about, we have different expressions that everything will remain when Mashiach comes except this part of Teter. That's the nida to tire loss of love, chazer to tire loss of love. You have different things that will be purified. So there's already sforim that talk about this at length, what that means. And how is it consistent with the fact that mitzvahs are, are eternal? But that's not the question here, so I'm not going to go there right now. That deserves its own discussion. Regarding the belief in Hashem, well, Amun of Hashem is not just a, meaning the absence of uh, apostasy, meaning belief. That, so then that question would be relevant. Today, you can have a question. You could be a skeptic. You could be an agnostic. You could be an atheist, whatever that means. So the mitzvah of Hashem is relevant. When once Mashiach comes, you're asking, since godliness will be revealed, we don't need a mitzvah. Yes, we don't need a mitzvah in context of not believing, but belief in Hashem is also a positive even for someone who doesn't have doubts. Belief in Hashem is connecting to Hashem. It means we have a super rational connection to God. So of course that mitzvah will be. Will it be in the context of belief versus non-belief? No. In belief itself, there's always levels of belief. In the Vyadaita. The Maimon of Yedaito Ayyem in Lekut Tere Veschanon, he says belief, das and amuna, knowing God and believing in God are relative. When you, today it may be through faith, tomorrow you learn more and that becomes das, internalized. Then the faith becomes greater. And then you need, and then das of that level, then faith, it's like climbing a mountain and you're seeing higher and higher dimensions, horizons of the divine. So there'll always be a moon, and a moon will always be, because there'll always be higher levels that we don't fully comprehend. And it's an infinite process, that it's a constant process of growth, level by level by level. Will there be a scoreboard? <laughs> and will those who did mitzvahs to make him come get rewarded? Well, we, uh, tend to see, our tendency is to compare it to uh, physical uh, examples. Mashiach is, much, is not just a scoreboard, no. Mashiach is the end result of a long process that began in the beginning of time of Jews' commitment to Yiddishkeit and before that, Odom Achav and Gan Eden. And all the sacrifices and Mesir Nefesh and dedication and commitment to goodness and kindness, all the mitzvahs done through the generations and the centuries and the millennia are all building blocks toward Mashiach. Why am I elaborating like that? 
Because it's not a scoreboard. It's a cause and effect. God created the world with a purpose. When we do what we need to do and align the world and our lives and existence and everything around us with God's will and what God wants, by following the operator's manual, life operator's manual called the Teda, using mitzvahs which are connections, we reach the destination which is the realization of the very purpose of existence. That's a far cry from a scoreboard. If you mean by a scoreboard as an aschar, in that sense, we'll all collectively and individually. But it's not quite like a, uh, a sports game or a competition. First of all, it's not as simplistic like that. And secondly, it's not tit for tat. We are here to transform ourselves and the world. And every good thought, good word, and good deed can tip the scale and bring gula, Yeshua v'atzala, Yeshua v'atzala, loyal kol ha'elem kula, as the Rambam says, to bring salvation and to bring and re- redemption to, your, to the individual and to the entire world. That's the context how I would put it. Will we get reward? That is called reward. Reward is not you get a candy. Schar mitzvah mitzvah. The reward of a mitzvah is the mitzvah itself and it's what the mitzvah releases is the divine energy that it releases as the Alter Rebbe explains in the beginning of chapter 37 in Tanya. So in that sense, yes. But not reward as a candy or some side thing. But it's reward, the ultimate reward. A world of peace, a world of health, a world of permanent life, a world of living up to the biggest, greatest potential and fulfilling what God wants of us, God's mandate to us. The Alter Rebbe says, chapter 36 in Tanya, that there was a taste of it by Matan Teda, which we're honoring and celebrating 3,333 years from Matan Teda. It was in the year 2448, now we're in 578, 57 payout, 81, 3,333, three. The Gemara says in Shabbos, that everything is a number of threes by Matan Teireh. In the third month from Nisan. On the third day from the from the from the Shlesha Shimei Akbala. The Teireh of three, Teireh Nevi'im Ksuvim, was given to a nation of three, Kahanim Levi'im Yisraelim. And he goes on to explain there in the commentaries many numbers of three. So three, 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 three seems very appropriate, but also in content, which brings me to the Chesidah supply of Shavuos, Three is shalom. One is a singular. Two is two different dimensions which have the potential to even have conflict. And three is the force that reconciles. But reconciliation, like teferis, chesed gvura teferis, takes both one and two and turns them into harmony. The harmony within diversity. By, Ma- by Pesach, the Jews' nisan was chesed. God took them out. God revealed himself, took them out of Egypt. It's time, the limitations, constraints. The month number two is, Svira Seymer, we count day by day, diversity. And comes the third, where we're dealing with the material world and our lives and our midas, our personalities and characteristics. Then comes the third month. The third month is number three, Tiferes. Harmony. Shalom is not just peace, is not just the absence of war. It creates a whole new synergy. The harmony within diversity. True beauty, Tiferes, is only possible when you have many different details. Different. And then you join them together. Beauty is only possible within diversity. One color blue, one color red, one musical note. As nice as it is, it can become monotonous. Beauty is when you have many different things and a composite in a harmonious and synchronized way. That's Tefera Zemat and Teda. So Mat and Teda is all about number three. So we're approaching that. What more blessing do we need? What greater blessing? Especially in face of what has gone on. Is deeper unity than ever. Let us demonstrate this year, Shavuos, Mat and Teda, a Shalom and a Ardus like never before. Unprecedented in history. 3,330 years, we can say, look back and let those generations see us and say, you know what happened? In the wake of Miran and the tragedy, Jews united in ways like never before. They had different communities, different customs, different backgrounds, different cultures, Sfardim, Ashkenazim, Chassidim, Nachsidim. This, this uh, community, 
that community, this Karais, that Karais. We may have different approaches. We may have very differing approaches. But there's a harmony within it all. All of us are needed by Matan Taylor. One person is missing, you don't have a Matan Taylor. That's what happened in the wake of Meran. Imagine we can pull that off. And it's really up to each of one of us as an individual. Because when you do your thing, it creates a ripple effect. Our job is not to fix others. Take care of yourself. Each one of us does that. And our rabbis and our leaders, and I call to my colleagues, the rabbis, leaders, Rosh Yeshiva, community leaders, scholars, let us all come out with a call and say, this year, Tav Shim Pei Aleph, 3,333 years from Matan Teda. And the wake of what has been going on, we're going to demonstrate an unprecedented call and action of unity like never seen before. It's possible. Remember, our communities are, even millions of people are all made up of individuals like you and I. If you cannot do it and I can do it, if we can resolve to do it, let's spread that word. That's what I suggest. Humble suggestion for this year, Martin Taylor. So Rabonim, Rosh Yeshivas, community leaders, Askonim, Mashpim, Mashgichim, and everyone. Let us join together in this effort and let us share it with each other. And Barchenu Avinu Kolonu Kachat. God will then without doubt, when he sees our children, his children united like that, will bring us, and shower us with blessings, also unprecedented blessings, and finally the blessing of the Gula Amitiz Vashlema. And there'll be Kol Godl Yeshuv Heino, entire people, as one Kol God, one great community will return. In our diversity, Atem Netzavim Ayem Kulchem, all the way to the leaders of the tribes, all the way to the water carriers and the wood choppers, but all the tzavim hayem kulchem, standing together as one. Wouldn't that be something? Please pass it on. Okay. Let me do a, a follow-up, two follow-ups. And then we'll do the Chassidus question and we'll do the essays. Okay. Two, uh, two episodes back in, two, in 352, episode 352, spoke about Mashiach's response to the Baal Shem Tov, that when will you come, when will you, Mashiach, come? When your wellsprings, the Baal Shem Tov's wellsprings, will spread your futzim and nesachachutz. And the question was, but he also said, when people will be able to create unifications like you do and go up to heaven, etc., so I spoke about it based on a letter from the Rebbe that your Futsiman Sachutz is a definite. The second part, may taka be, not everybody can do. That's what he, the Rebbe says there in the letter. And we spoke about that. So someone wrote the following. I have a suggestion to answer what is the meaning of the second part of the answer of the Boshemtiv. Just in short, I suggest it comes to the point of making Baal Tshuva. Like the famous story of the Magid, to make a Baal Tshuva, he said, Um, like the famous story of the Magid, to make a Baal he said Teira, until the storm came and brought the boy out of the church. Or the story that the Rebbe brings in the first Maimer, Boslagani, about the Rebbe Marash, in order to make a Baal he himself had to go to Paris. Or the story with the dream of the Mitla Rebbe and the Alta Rebbe that our Rebbe says, that this story gives us the power to be able to make Baal Tshuva, which means to introduce people who are born, not into Yiddishkeit, or not into Shem Teira Mitzvahs, to discover what Yiddishkeit is. I think the idea of making Baal Tshuva is these Yechudim. That's what these Yechudim refer to this writer, right? It's these unifications. And when it comes to the point of being able to make Baal Tshuva, that every 13th year could make a Baal Tshuva, that's the point that after Afat Sasamayonis, we actually make real Baal Tshuva. This is the Yechudim. This is my thought all the time about this. In Hebrew, Yechudim, their Indian is Halas Man. That's what a Yechud is. You take 
the world that may be fragmented, and you create, you elevate it. And that's the idea of tshuva, where you unite things together. And everyone has that power to do that. Okay, thank you for that. I also spoke about two weeks ago about, um, uh, about putting a zdoka pushka near, in your room. So dear Rabbi Jacobson, last week you read a letter where someone suggested keeping a zdoka box next to their bed in order to give zdoka first thing in the morning and begin the day with an act of kindness. That is a great idea, and it's spreading throughout the community. May Hashem bless the person who had that idea, that they should be physically wealthy so they can afford to bring to begin the day with a larger amount of tzedakah and a bigger act of kindness. Another person writes, maybe the same person, I'm not sure. Dear Rabbi Jacobson, my family are big fans of your Sunday night Torah and Chassidus program. We usually eat dinner together Sunday night and then watch your program for dessert. Sometimes you read mail you receive that doesn't seem supportive of your program. So I wanted to write a short letter to let you know how much we appreciate what you do and how we benefit from it. Last week, you made a great suggestion that people should keep a zdoka box in their bedroom in order to start the day with an act of kindness the moment they wake up. I put a zdoka box in my bedroom and my children's bedroom so we can participate in this great idea. We are telling you so you can be aware your words have a positive effect on the community and your words honor the Rebbe who would be happy to know people in the community are increasing in Torah, mitzvahs, and acts of kindness. Sincerely. Okay. Thank you. Okay. With that, I'm going to go to the Chassidus question, which is regarding, unfortunately, tragedy. My question is understanding this chapter in Agar Sarkadish. It seems that the Altar Rebbe is saying that Yidin who struggle with their tragedies in life and don't embrace their suffering, that they should be better off, not have been created, and are heir of Rav, etc. It seems astoundingly insensitive and not the Derek of Chassidus to berate those who are suffering and in such terrible pain. How can Hashem inflict so much pain and expect us to embrace it or else? It seems like the Alter Rebbe would be better off just saying, get over it, would seem less insensitive that way than the way it's addressed there. In Patek 26 in Tanya, it's addressed with so much more de- deference and sensitivity. Please help us gain clarity in this bewildering chapter in Tanya's Egeda Sakesh. So I read it as is, even though I think it's a little disrespectful the way this was written, because I like to read the way people write it, but I want to, I want to qualify it. You read it properly. First of all, you have to remember the Alta Rebbe with such tremendous and awesome Avis Yisrael would never write anything to berate anybody. So number one, Peter Kedal of Nagaras the Rebbe points out, is not necessarily for every person on every level. Even though we all can learn from it, as I'll mention, I'll explain in a moment, but he writes it, in the singular because it is a high level where he expects people to realize that this whole material world is superficial and it's all about the divine energy and divine energy can only be good. When he says those words, God forbid he's not saying that to any individual who's suffering a tragedy. You think the Alter Rebbe didn't know people suffering tragedies and they sat Shiva and he had Rahmanas on them? Of course. He's saying inside the emes of the Indian. The Indian is that if a person were cognizant how everything is divine energy, and recognize that the entire world, including its tragedies, is only a test, only a Nisayan, then, the, then it wouldn't be seen that way. So he's creating a standard that's very high, and given, albeit, that most of us cannot reach. But the Altareb is not going to mince words and tell us that's not the truth. Now the question is, how much can we reach there? How much can we see? I've seen some of the parents and some of the families grieving over the Miran the losses they have in the Muran. And I, I'm in awe. They're, they're like fulfilling what it says in chapter 11 there. Not that they don't feel the pain. They're not on that level. But they recognize that Hashem has a deeper plan. Hashem has everything is good. So al Rebbe is setting the standard. That's one thing I want to say. And all of us can learn from that. Because it's important to know that we ultimately are controlled so much by the material world. That's how God made it. So we have, God has Rahmanus on us. But we have to keep in mind that higher standard. The Rebbe says, in Kutta Sikhs, volume one at the end, talks about the three places in Tanya that deals with Yisurim. One is in chapter 26 that you mentioned, where he talks about, and the second is Nagar Sakedish, two Nagar Sakedish. One is 
that Biba Simcha in the future will see the, the greater good. The second Nagaris Akedish Simen Chavhei talks about that, um, that it's like a, 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 mother, a mother or a parent cleaning the dirt off a child, so therefore it comes out cross negative, but it's really a positive. And, and this one, it's an Nisoyen, it's a test. The Rebbe actually refers to 11, to Gersh Kedish 11, as being the one that we can now more embrace than the others. It's a test. But it's still a test, and it's still a negative challenge. No one's suggesting otherwise. So I think it's all understanding the context and how it's written. And also, the Altar doesn't begin Tanya with Peter Kiralaf of Gersh Kedish. Not that he hides it, God forbid, but I mean to say, you have to know any introduction before you get to that place, and then you can appreciate its context. Okay. And when he says, not better not to be born, he doesn't mean that literally. He means, since your whole purpose of existence is to fulfill what God wants, and you're unable to see that, so in a sense, your purpose of existence is not being fulfilled. That's the meaning, what he means when he says those words. Okay. So now let's go quickly to the essays. We are the 2020 annual My Life Citizen Applied Essay and Creative Contest. And we have, we're doing four each week. We're now up to 22nd place of these excellent essays. The English essays can be seen at, at the chsidasupply.com. The Hebrew ones can be seen at diraloi, D-I-R-A-L-O dot, dot org. So, the English essay, Peeling Away the Mask, the Hasidic Guide to Overcoming Imposter Syndrome. I personally benefit greatly from this essay. It's by Mallory, Mallory Rostin, age 23, a student, my Yonot woman. Originates from Alpharetta, hometown Alpharetta, Georgia. As I said, I personally benefited from it. It's an excellent essay. Uses the issue of imposter syndrome, why people put on a show or put on a different face or mask in their lives and shows how Chassidus helps us deal with our issues of why we do that. Highly recommended. The creative essay is about Yutzvat. It's a sketchbook by Mushki Cyprus, age 22, teacher, Lubavitch, London, UK. The Hebrew essay, Men, True freedom, the way to actualize the hidden potential within you. Menachem Mendel Sudakevich, student, Kvar Chabad, Israel. And finally, in Hebrew essay, Women, Yiten v'yitnu acherim chasit. Michal Turnheim, student, Betari Lit, Israel. And that addresses the issue of always being a giver and not just a taker. And even when you need something, how you transform that, using chassidus of how we look at life in general instead of egocentric, but looking at life in a much broader God-centric fashion. With that, we conclude My Life Chassidus Applied, episode 354. Everyone have a very healthy, loving, unifying Simcha Dika week, transforming Yogin the Simcha. Let's march into Matan Teda, Matan Teda, March into the Gula Amit is Rashlema. Kabola Satere Besimcha Beprimius. Next Sunday there won't be a program because of Yom Tov. See you in two weeks from now. Every Sunday, 8 to 9 p.m. Freilichen Shvuas and Freilichen Tomid. Always good news. This program is brought to you by My Life, Chasidis Applied. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at chasidisapplied.com slash donate.